Good evening, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here. Thanks for tuning in to the China History Podcast. Part 7 this time in our award-winning series, which does a nice, shallow dive into the main history surrounding the warlord era in China. Last time we made it as far as the end of the Second Zhili Fengtian War. Turned out a little, little bit better for Zhang Zolin this time around. He and the betrayer general, Feng Yuxiang, join forces to send Wu Peifu running to the Nanking warlord, Sun Chuan Feng, for protection and to regroup. And even though he got walloped in this new war with Zhang Zolin, Wu Peifu hasn't been written out of the script yet. In this second encounter with the Manchurian warlord, Wu Peifu's best laid plans did not work out as he had hoped. Remember last time there were two things that blended into each other. First, there was the jiangsu Jiang War that moved up the timetable for Wu Peifu and forced his hand to enter this war with Zhang Zolin half-cocked. Wu Peifu and his Zhili military were counting on a certain concatenation of events to happen in such a way that when the last move was made, he'd be left on top. He had tried to buy off the Anhui clique to get them on his side, though no longer a military threat. Duan Qi Rei's organization still had a solid power base in Shanghai and the lower Yangtze region. So that didn't work out either. So Duan ended up siding with Zhang Zolin. Wu Peifu also was counting on making overtures to bring Sun Yat-sen and his whole Canton government organization over to the Zhili side. This would have left Zhang Zolin isolated in the Northeast, ready to be taken down at a time of Wu Peifu's choosing. But it didn't end up that way either. The prospective allies Wu Peifu was hoping to attract sided with his enemy. And in Sun Yat-sen's case, he got tied down dealing with local emergencies. And the second Zhili Fengtian War ended up being a massive military defeat for Wu Peifu and the entire Zhili organization. After he had won and all the dust settled from the second Zhili Fengtian War, Zhang Zolin had to set up another provisional government. I don't know which one this was since 1912. This was one of the hallmarks of the warlord era in China, the revolving doors in the halls of power in the Beijing government. And through this control of the government in Beijing came control of tax revenues, which allowed them to wear the ring of legitimacy in front of the Chinese people and the foreign powers. Winning the war was easy for Zhang Zolin compared to figuring out a way to divide up the spoils with Feng Yuxiang. That was going to be awkward. Zhang Zolin was much stronger than Feng Yuxiang, so he ended up with the good areas, and Feng Yuxiang got stuck with Sui Yuan, Cha Har, and Gansu. Sui Yuan and Cha Har were old provinces located adjacent to each other in what is today parts of Inner Mongolia, where all the action is. Baotou, Hohat, Ordos, and Wuhai. And you thought he'd never bounce back from those Nishihara loans, but Duan Shi Rei was installed as provisional chief executive of this new government. Zhang Zolin, Feng Yuxiang, and Lu Yongxiang had all met in Tianjin in November 1924 to talk this idea over with Duan Qi Rei. Though not ideal, Duan was the least despised and best compromise candidate available at that time. And in a grand gesture that meant well, but didn't turn out as anyone hoped, Sun Yat-sen was invited by this new government to come up to Beijing and confer with Chang Zolin, Feng Yuxiang, and others about reconciliation and unification of the country. By the end of 1924, when this invitation came, Sun Yat-sen was already 58 years old and not in good health. He didn't know it yet, but he had end stages cancer already. But he took these warlords up on their offer and made the trip anyway. And when he got to Beijing, he saw a doctor was diagnosed with cancer and given days to live. Despite that, he hung in there till March 12, 1925, and then Sun Yat-sen was gone. That was a body blow to the KMT. Now who were the warlords supposed to negotiate with? 
I won't get into it here, but there were a few men who had been quietly clamoring for the mantle of Sun Yat-sen in these final months. One, of course, was Chiang Kai-shek. The others were Wang Jingwei and Hu Hanmin. There's going to be an old-fashioned power struggle, and, well, you all know who prevails in the end. Meanwhile, up in the north of China, everyone knew it was bound to happen sooner or later. Relations between Zhang Zolin and Feng Yuxiang began to deteriorate. And as it happens, these two rivals and their respective cliques, the Guomintun and Feng Tian, well, they were going to end up battling it out, just like Anhui and Zhirli, and Zhirli and Feng Tian. Now came the next of these major wars of the era, the Anti-Feng Tian War, also called the Third Zhirli-Feng Tian War. In the lead-up to this war, both Feng Yuxiang and Chang Zolin separately sent envoys to Wu Peifu, seeking his alliance in their war against the other. His army wasn't what it used to be, but Wu Peifu could still put together a sizable force. Who did Wu Peifu side with? He had already faced down Chang Zolin twice. He beat him the first time, and now, thanks to his defeat at the hands of the Manchurian warlord, Wu Peifu was in much reduced circumstances compared to the salad days of 1922 to 1924 and living off the kindness of Sun Chuan Fang. But despite all that bad blood between Wu Peifu and Chang Zolin, what Feng Yuxiang had done to the Jade Marshal, Wu Peifu, now that really stuck in his craw. And Wu Peifu wanted his revenge against this betraying general. And he didn't want to wait until his dish was served cold. So Wu Peifu joined hands with enemy Zhang Zolin to put an end to Feng Yuxiang. One thing that Zhirli and Feng Tian cliques had going for themselves was access to the sea. That meant importing foreign armaments was a heck of a lot more convenient for them. In Suiyuan and Chahar, Inner Mongolia, well, that's pretty far inland, not too many seaports. But it was quite close to the Soviet Union. And the Soviets, by 1925, were heavy in the arms business. They made a lot of nice stuff. And Feng Yuxiang was one of their best customers. In China, from the late Qing military modernization programs to the whole long, drawn-out warlord era and all the way up through the end of the Civil War in 1949, the arms industry truly feasted in China. Feng Yuxiang set up his headquarters in Zhangjiakou, to the northwest of Beijing. And this city is also known in Chinese history by its Mongol name of Kalgan. His contact for Soviet arms and munitions was Michael Borodin of the Comintern. I should do an episode on him. In February 1925, Feng Yuxiang had been receiving all these Russian weapons shipped via the Trans-Siberian and via old-fashioned caravans pulling 500 carts of Rifles, carbines, machine guns, hand grenades, and tens of millions of rounds of ammo. So when it was time to face off against Zhang Zolin on the ancient northern plains of China, he was going to be fully locked and loaded. For this third Zhirli Feng Tian War, or anti Feng Tian War, it all kicked off in October 1925 when one of Zhang Zolin's most trusted but later thoroughly disgruntled generals, Guo Songling, turned on him and besieged the seat of power in the Feng Tian clique, the city of Shenyang. For this fight, General Guo thought he was getting some prearranged support from Feng Yixiang, but, well, when it came to promises, these warlords often <laughs> couldn't count on each other. And this is what happened here. After being left in a lurch in this three-month mutiny against Zhang Zolin for Guo Songling, it ended on the night before Christmas when the siege was lifted. This turncoat general, Guo Songling, and his wife too, they were captured and shot. And with this act, it spelled the end to the ill-fated alliance between the Manchurian warlord and the Christian warlord. Feng Yuxiang had not only betrayed his first ally, Wu Peifu, but his second one as well, Zhang Zolin. Guo Songling's defeat in Shenyang was a huge setback for Feng Yuxiang, as taking this stronghold of Zhang Zolin was pretty central to his overall plan. And then from that point on into 1926, 
It was all downhill for the Christian warlord. Wu Pei Fu had had his revenge. With the armies of Zhang Zuo Lin, Wu Pei Fu, the dogmeat general Zhang Tong Chang, and other warlords I haven't mentioned, all bearing down on Feng Yuxiang, well, he hopped on the next available transport to Russia, announced his retirement, and remained there for a stretch until Jiang Kai-shek's people came knocking on his door. So now, with bitter enemies, Zhang Zuolin and Wu Pei-fu victorious together in battle against their common foe, Feng Yuxiang, together they had to figure out a way to govern the north and do that unification thing too while they were at it. This, of course, was doomed from the start. And by now, 1925, 1926, everyone from the top down in Chinese society, from the villagers to the hipsters and all the foreign enclaves and all the major cities, everyone had grown so sick of these warlords. Almost a decade of trying to bump each other off for the sake of seizing control of Beijing had injured, killed, and profoundly disrupted the lives of too many people. The organized popular resistance to warlord rule really started to become more widespread. You remember from many past episodes, the May 30th movement, May 30, 1925, well, that began up in Shanghai. A lot of this popular discontent was expressed through all kinds of protests, and many were directed at these jinfa. That word was sort of a pejorative for these kinds of militarists. This is where the word warlord started to be bandied about more contemptuously in the foreign press. And the literature that was floating around intellectual circles pulled no punches in its condemnation of the warlords and the lasting damage they were doing to the country. By now, the idea of forming a national army and taking it to these regional strongmen... Well, it wasn't such a hard sell to anyone, except the warlords. This notion of mobilizing an army, marching north, and defeating these self-serving warlords who had so abused their positions. Well, this is where the idea for the northern expedition came. And we're almost there. Let's talk about a warlord. I've mentioned a couple times, but haven't given you his one-of-a-kind story. This was Zhang Tongchang, and in talking about this most Colorful and controversial of warlords. We can go back and review a few of the events we've looked at these past episodes. He doesn't start to make headlines until 1925, and he sticks around till about 1929, and by 1932, he's gone. Well, here's one more warlord for you, and I know you're going to like him. Zhang Tongchang, the dog meat general, the Gou Rou Jun. He didn't get that name because he liked to eat dog meat. Eating dog meat, that was a Northeast China slang term for gambling on cards. Pico, I'm, I'm guessing. Of all these warlords I've introduced and all their excesses, this one more than any other was the superlative. Even the great John King Fairbank, one of the most sacred cows among Western sinologists, called Zhang Zongchang someone who, quote, gave warlords a bad name. In today's popular history, he's known for his various nicknames, and a collection of anecdotes about the many antics attributed to Zhang Zongchang during his military career. He was another Shandong guy. He was born in Laizhou on the north Shandong coast, west of Yantai. Like Zhang Zolin, he only had a couple years of formal education, and accounts vary about his literacy. He was quite a poet later on in life, in the how shall I say, in the, in the Andrew Dice Clay reciting Mother Goose uh, kind of way. And this being a family program and all, I dare not treat you to any of the Dog Meat General's poetry. He didn't have a fancy military education like most of these other fellows we've discussed. No National Military Academy for Chang Tong Chang. His mother, well, this was part of his story too. He honored her to the max till his dying day. And it's said he took his beloved mother with him wherever he went, except onto the field of battle. Back home in Shandong, she was said to have been a, a witch or some kind of exorcist back in her village. And his father, and most of the sources I found, all agreed he was a head shaver by trade and played the trumpet. In other words, he didn't come for money. The dog meat general, 
He had as hard scrabble a childhood as he could get in a poor part of Shandong. He was huge. Fully grown, he was 1.98 meters tall. That's six foot six to my fellow Americanskis. He was a big guy. And around the turn of the century, in that final decade of the Qing dynasty, Zhang Zongchang, like so many others who were dealt a similar hand in life, he turned to banditry as a way to make a living. If you did well and got noticed, yeah, there was always a chance of promotion within these kind of organizations. Zhang Zongchang ended up fighting in Jiangsu for the local warlord for a stint. He also saw action in the Russo-Japanese War, fighting on the side of the Russians. Later on in the 1920s, yeah, he had an interesting relationship with the Russians, and even kept as a regiment in his army a white Russian guard, numbering about 4,000. He was famous for dressing up some of these troops in these old-style, loud and bodacious old Russian military uniforms. And he had a fair number of Russian concubines later on as well. After serving in Jiangsu without much to show for himself, he wandered north up to Manchuria, Zhang Zolin's territory. He made a living on the streets of Harbin, getting involved in more banditry as well as petty crime, and I'm betting crimes that weren't so petty. And later on, after the Wuchang uprising, he looked for opportunities in the Feng Tian army. He joined up and later on got himself noticed by Zhang Zolin, and in time gained the Manchurian warlord's trust. One of the vignettes from Zhang Zongchang's Greatest Hits package that got remembered or made up and passed down was the story of Zhang Zolin's birthday party. Naturally, all the men invited to celebrate with the great man. Well, they were all trying to outdo each other in the extravagance of the gifts presented to him. As for Zhang Zongchang, well, he no-showed, first of all. And as his gift, he sent two empty coolie baskets and a pole accompanied with a note that said he would shoulder any responsibility given to him. And he wanted to have a couple of victories chalked up first before he was willing to stand before the Manchurian warlord. Now, before we jump to his involvement in the aftermath of the Zhejiang Jiangsu War and afterwards when he became the warlord of Shandong, let's look at a few other anecdotes about Zhang Zongchang. A Peking University president once described Zhang Zongchang when he was serving as the Dujun or military governor of Shandong as someone who, quote, had the physique of an elephant, the brain of a pig, and the temperament of a tiger. Time magazine once called him the basest warlord. James E. Sheridan called him, quote, perhaps the best exemplification of the brutality and exploitation of which warlords were capable, end quote. One of his other nicknames was the Shandong Monster. One of his more well-known atrocities that his troops engaged in was the game of opening melons, that was a euphemism for splitting skulls open with swords. He was also a proponent of the idea of hanging severed heads of editors and journalists who criticized him from telegraph poles as warnings to others not to protest and to engage in a little self-censorship in what they printed. Members of secret societies, they too had their heads hung from telegraph poles. Interestingly, he was also one of the earliest modern Chinese military organizations that incorporated women into the army. But it was his harem and the conspicuousness with which he incorporated these women into his whole persona that made him so hard to forget. His harem consisted of something like 40 women. A number varies. Someone uh, reported they were from 26 different nationalities, and each one had a number and the flag of the woman's nation imprinted on her wash basin. And they accompanied Zhang Zongchang to various public and private affairs and banquets and served as hostesses at his extravagant parties. He couldn't remember their names and referred to them by the numbers assigned to them. And speaking of numbers, although I contemplated leaving this out, you know, the CHP being this long-running family program that it is, Zhang Zongchang also had a couple other nicknames, Old 86 and Old 63. Because if you took a stack of 63 Yuan Shikai dollar coins or 86 silver dollars and piled them up on top of the other, well, that stack of coins would add up to the length of the dog meat generals. Mm, you know what. Later on, he acquired the nickname 72 Cannon Zhang. 
this arose out of an incident in 1929-1930 when Shandong province was gripped by this famine caused by lots of sun and no rain. Well, something this big was a job for Zhang Zongchang. It was said he first visited the temple where the god was housed, who was responsible for the weather. And rather than lighting up some incense and saying a prayer or two, he took his big, meaty hands and slapped the statue of the god repeatedly and berated him for causing this natural calamity and causing such hardship to the people of his province, Shandong. It said he ordered one of his artillery units to fire into the clouds, and they did this 72 times before all that silver iodide started reacting with the clouds and the rain started falling. He was also known as the Three Don't Knows General, the San Bujer Jiangjun. The three things he didn't know, if you asked him, was how many women in his harem, how much money he had, and how many troops under his command. The three don't knows, ladies and gentlemen. He chain-smoked Manila cigars, the Cubans of Asia, and I have it on good authority he was also a big fan of the opium pipe. The great writer and all-around man of letters, Lin Yutang, wrote an essay called In Memoriam of the Dog Meat General that was written on the morning Chang Tong Chang died, September 3, 1932. Let me lift a few quotes from this work. Lin Yutang wrote of him, quote, He was the most honest and unashamed of all the colorful, legendary medieval and unashamed rulers of modern China. He was direct, forceful, terribly efficient at times, obstinate, and gifted with moderate intelligence. He made no pretenses to being a gentleman. He was ruthlessly honest, and this honesty made him much loved by all his close associates. If he loved a woman, he would say so, and he would see foreign consuls with a Russian girl sitting on his knee. If he held orgies, he didn't try to conceal them from his friends and foes. If he coveted his subordinate's wife, he told him openly and wrote no psalm of repentance about it like King David. And he was always square. If he took his subordinate's wife, he made her husband chief of police in Jinan. Because of his honesty and his generosity, he was beyond the hatred of his fellow men. The morning I entered my office and informed my colleagues of the great news, everyone smiled, which showed that everyone was friendly towards him. No one hated him, and no one could hate him. China was by then still being ruled by men like him who hadn't his honesty, generosity, and loyalty. He was a born ruler, such as modern China wants, and he was the best of them all. End quote. For all his eccentricities, brutality, and depravity, now he was one of Zhang Zolin's better generals. He was a fighter. Well, more of his antics later. Last episode in part six, we discussed the Zhejiang Jiangsu War and how that tied into the second Zhirli Feng Tian War. Zhang Zongchang had fought for Zhang Zolin and Team Feng Tian, which included Duan Qi Rei and his Anhui clique. And for a job well done, scoring a number of victories in this most destructive war to date in this warlord era. Duan and Zhang Zolin saw to it that Zhang Zongchang was made the military governor of Shandong, and it was during this time, as warlord of Shandong, that most of the legend of the dog meat general got written. Prior to his stint as Du Jun of Shandong, he briefly held things together in Shanghai for Zhang Zolin. And for that brief period he was there, partygoers and lovers of vice had a mini golden age. It was said Zhang Zongchang and Zhang Zolin's son, the young marshal, Zhang Xueliang, now those two partied together like it was 1999. They got high smoke and opium and visited all the night spots that were all part of the mystique of 1920 Shanghai. He was chums with Big Air Du, you remember him, Du Yuesheng, boss of the Green Gang, the most powerful crime syndicate in Shanghai. All those gangsters got on famously with Zhang Zongchang, as you could imagine. The vice trade in 1920 Shanghai was already not doing too bad. And for the short period between the end of the Second Zhirli Feng Tian War until Zhang Zongchang left for Shandong in April 1925, well, those who enjoyed the 
seamy underside of Shanghai society, so wonderfully and colorfully depicted in Paul French's book from 2018, City of Devils. They got to really let it all hang out without limits. Well, that's the dog meat general. 72 Canon Zhang, old 86, and a host of other epithets for this eccentric and sometimes quite amusing, but otherwise brutal, violent, and impulsive man who, well, despite all that, had the loyalty and respect of his troops, and who, well, more often than not, delivered for his boss, Zhang Zolin. And the old marshal, he took care of Zhang Zongchang, and as I said, gave him the magnificent and historic province of Shandong to govern, as warlords do. And Most of the worst stories about his brutality and some of the more unsavory things attributed to him happened during this period that ended in May 1928. After the anti-Feng Tian War ended and Feng Tian emerged as the winner, that's pretty much it as far as this 10-year spate of intra-warlord warfare involving all these militarists and their minions fighting each other. And everything is going to reach a crescendo in the Northern Expedition, which will be led by Generalissimo Jiang Kai-shek. And for the balance of this series, we'll focus on that final chapter of the Chinese warlord era. The final chapter, but not the epilogue. There will, there will still be the Central Plains War, but trust me, there's still more to come. Before I go, let me recommend a new history podcast called Stories of the Second World War. Every episode features engaging discussions with military historians and leading experts as they provide insight into the many facets of this greatest of conflicts in our modern history. Episodes about Winston Churchill, featuring acclaimed Churchill biographer Andrew Roberts, Big Week, the largest air battle of World War II with BBC broadcaster James Holland, and many more fascinating conversations can be heard on stories of the Second World War. You could subscribe to this podcast on any of the very same podcast apps that are willing to stoop to have me on their platform. Another round of thanks to all my Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash China History Podcast. Prefer to show some love using PayPal instead? Go to paypal.me slash China History Podcast and donate to your heart's content to this worthy cause. I've been doing this for going on 10 years come June 2020. I thank you. Okay, Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from Los Angeles, California, on a nice rainy day. The snow on the San Bernardino Mountains looks great, like a postcard. You should come out here and see it. Please think about joining me again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.